Hi, this is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I want you all to know that new episodes of The Glenn Show come out every Monday at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show and are then made available for the general audience the following Friday. I also want you to know that I've recently started a free newsletter at glennlowry.substack.com where I've been publishing transcripts of some of the things that are said on the show. So please consider subscribing. Thanks. Okay, now forgive my ignorance. I'm just a humble economist over here. Uh, Good for you. <laughs> what is postmodernism? Again, I know that's going to sound like a very silly question, but uh, I have no, to it's a hard question because all the people who are postmodernists denied that they were postmodernists. And then you have people like Judith Butler, who are, are extremely postmodern, who said that if we defined postmodernism, it wouldn't really be postmodern anymore. So I can't be a postmodernist and there can't be a definition of postmodernism. But my kind of working definition, given what's going on, is it, it, it I mean, we could pick a number of working definitions, but one of them is um, the belief that a claim upon truth is actually an application of power. That in fact, to make a claim on truth, you have to have been given the power to make that claim, the authority, whether it's by becoming a humble economist, whether it's by becoming a scientist and being credentialed with a PhD, whether it's by being appointed to a presidential council or the cabinet or whatever else, to, in order to make like Fauci has been appointed to the role that he's in um, to speak on behalf of COVID-19. So their claim is that power decides who gets to claim what it is, is and is not true. And so as Michel Foucault had it, uh, his belief, and I think this is really quintessential of Foucauldian postmodernism, is that if you have a claim upon the truth, a statement that you're saying may be true, it might actually be true or false, but that misses the point. That Foucault said it misses the point to discuss whether a claim on the truth is actually true or false, because the point is that you have to interrogate the power dynamics that allowed somebody to have the authority to make that claim. And so it's a complete shift away from epistemology into turning everything into kind of this squabbling about power dynamics. There are other there are other there are other definitions that we could apply. I mean, the postmodern condition, for example, just to broaden this impossible thing, as laid out by uh, uh, Jean Francois Lyotard in the postmodern condition, is 1979 when he wrote that. He said that simplifying in the extreme, very famous sentence. Post I define postmodern as an incredulity toward meta narratives. Meta narratives being broad sweeping explanations for how things work and how things should be contextualized. Um, in a sense, what it what what their claim what postmodernism could then be boiled down to is that every attempt to talk about how the world works is sort of on an even playing field, where none of them should be believed too seriously. They should all be seen as kind of social and political constructions. In other words, the social or cultural construction of knowledge and its relationship to power is the primary object of interest of postmodern philosophy. Now, every claim seems inordinately strong but it some, does. some important claims uh resting on power dynamics seems like a hypothesis worth entertaining i, I mean, agree in fact i point out that the, the if we look i mentioned fauci quite intentionally if we look at how the covid 19 policy you know there's much skepticism at least on the right around it uh if you look at this situation the way you know Fauci said, don't wear a mask. Then he said, wear a mask. Then he said, wear two masks. Then he said, the CDC maybe doesn't know if you should wear two masks. Then he said, nope, probably two masks. Maybe we have to do three masks. When you see this kind of thing happening, people say, how did this happen? Why is the number changing? And of course, science has to find answers and develop. I think it's reasonable to say, you know, people are making their best guesses. And as they get better information, they'll update those guesses. But there's also the possibility when you get into anything fuzzier than like Newtonian physics, which is quite cut and dry, you get into anything fuzzier than the very hard sciences, that you do have this kind of human element that has to be investigated and interrogated. I would say that that's probably something that you face a lot in economics as well. Um, it, it's a difficult, the, 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 what's, what am I looking for? The order of complexity of the problem is extremely high. And so human influences 
are a little higher than say, you know, building a rocket to go to Jupiter, which is just straight, simple Newtonian mechanics. And you can get it there with a second's worth of accuracy. And they are a little bit nuanced around this, but if you read, for example, Lyotard, he's qu quite, I just mentioned, he's absolutely just savagely critical of science as being one of these kind of meta narrative type things that needs to be doubted that it's just another form of legitimation by paralogy, he calls it, which means legitimation by consensus rather than legitimation by finding, you know, reliable evidence. And then later in his life, he says that he was, he, he actually didn't know what he was talking about with the science. And he actually just butchered that by making a bunch of assumptions. And that he, he claimed near the end of his life that that was one, that, that like his most embarrassing work. It was, it's his worst book. And it's taken as kind of the staple. So these 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 guys were were intellectual show offs, and they were primarily working within. They were looking primarily at soft sciences, where I grant them a hundred percent. It's not well developed, it's not hard and fast, and there's a lot of the stuff they were talking about present there. These guys being the French, uh, the French uh, postmodernists. Yeah, I just think they were cynical in their approach, to be honest. Good observations, bad prescriptions, very cynical. Well, there is some stuff. I was just having this conversation this morning with somebody about money. Uh, he was saying money is not real. He's saying money is a <laughs> fiction. And I was trying to explain, no, no, no. What money is, is a convention. Uh, it's a convention that works because of the mutuality of people's expectations. Mm -hmm. I take the dollar bill from you, which is worthless in and of itself, only because I anticipate someone else will take it from me in return for something that's of value. They are willing to render something of value to me for that dollar bill in turn, only because they anticipate that others will buy into the convention that the dollar bill can be exchanged for things of value. Right. Now, that is a very interesting subject, intersubjectivity of uh, human uh, convention. Uh, it's not real in some objective sense, it's, it's, it's uh, subjective, but it's extremely powerful. And we can, you know, the dollar bill is the least of these. I mean, what about debt? What, what about the complex financial uh, instruments that we see being exchanged? What about Bitcoin? All of these things are constructions of a kind. Uh, and uh, there's it just seems to me to be a lot of traction in, um, in, in, in being able to enter into that kind of, uh, in that kind of reflection. So what I would tell you is that you have encountered where you have an extremely nuanced view. You've encountered kind of the postmodern flattening of that view to, you know, know it's a convention, all these complicated, you know, important things to understand. Yes, it is in some sense a socially constructed artifice. And yet to say it's just a fiction. That's the postmodern flattening of something much more complex and nuanced. And I think that you find this repeatedly, especially, you know, Lyotard's confession about science later, is that there, there there's a, a lack of desire to fully understand the thing they criticized. And there's often a, while there many of their descriptions about power, especially social power are very spot on and very worth entertaining and worth mining, I would say for what they can teach us, especially about a, a world where social media is dominant. Um, at the same time, cynical, simplistic, underinformed, and disinterested uh, in in any level of complexity or, or deep understanding, any perspicacity, would is, is how I would characterize their their work. Um, Foucault wrote these genealogies; he called them. He originally called them archaeologies, and the most contemporary copy of what he did is a 1619 project. They unearth various truths, contextualize them in a story that paints a consistently negative, more negative picture than reality. Whereas there are other ways to interpret that same data or to, to flesh it out with other data and create a more, I think, fair picture of what's actually going on. So it's very easy to be pessimistic and cynical that way. And I feel like that's a trap they fell into. Well, I've been very critical of the 1619 Project here at the Glenn Show and elsewhere. So I wanted to note that. However, I wanted to then go on and ask you, how could the dispute between different narratives, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the 1619 Project, we should think of the founding of the country as 1619, slavery is elemental, the principles of the founding fathers were not actually realized because of the structure of American society at that time. Slavery 
not least amongst the offenses. Um, and we've been struggling for 200 plus years to right the ship here or to realize the ideals that were, and we should, we should understand that through the lens of African-American freedom struggle and so forth. That's one story. Uh, mm -hmm. Another story is, you know, America, the exceptional nation, land of the free, and so on. What is the objective ground for discriminating as between these narratives, other than the power of people, the control, the podium, and uh, the the mediums of uh, of information dissemination, the the, me the news media, the prizes that are given? Isn't it ultimately a struggle for power? I mean, just a... There, is there Almost. any objective way of ascertaining whether there's a correct or incorrect narrative about the American uh, founding? So what I would tell you is the 1619 Project is an attempt to rewrite the mythology of America. And I would tell you that the mythology of America that we promoted in the 1950s was certainly a mythology of America. In, in a very real sense, it was it was definitely mythological, it, it, this exceptional nation. There are reasons that we could say that America is special. A nation founded on ideas, for example, is one particular way. A nation that's based in, in hopefully neutral principles of constitutional law as adjudicated as best as possible by an imperfect judicial system. But nevertheless, uh, we have an attempt to rewrite a mythology competing against, and in my, my opinion, just to render it flatly, is that when we look at these critical race theorists, because that's who these people are, Nicole Hannah-Jones has picked up a large amount of this, whether she is one or not, technically, she's picked up a lot of this line of thought. What you have is an attempt to write a new mythology to replace a mythology that was dominant in the 1950s. And they act as though that mythology is still, from the 1950s, is still the thing to compete against as though that is still the predominant belief of most Americans, which I think is an absurd claim. I think that we actually made a lot of progress since the 1950s, but for their stuff to make sense, they have to pretend we have not and that all that progress has been fake. So you mentioned Derrick Bell, and that was essentially his thesis. The Civil Rights Act actually just made things worse. Brown versus Board of Education just made things worse for African Americans. And that, that's his thesis. It's a very pessimistic and, and almost paranoid approach to what was happening, although it's not to, again, replace it with some rosy garbage like, no, you know, we passed Civil Rights Act in 1964, Voting Rights Act in 65, another Civil Rights Act in 68, and then everything was perfect. Nobody, nobody believes that, I don't think, uh, right? It's, but there's this comparison between these two national mythologies that very few people if you were to get down to brass tacks and do a poll, especially four or five years ago before all this stuff blew up, very few people would believe either one of those mythologies in whole. And so this is where we look at that, you know, incredulity toward meta narratives. These mythologies are meta narratives about the United States. So we have to be a little bit incredulous about these. Now, is there an objective podium from which we can find? I don't think so, to be That's honest, not fully, but there are matters of fact. We can read. Thomas Jefferson, in his own words that he wrote himself, struggling with the issue. We can read Abraham Lincoln, in his own words, struggling with the issue. We can read Frederick Douglass, in his own words, you know, attacking the issue and appealing to that set of ideas that the United States was founded on. And so, you know, this is, I think, when people say we should tell the history of the United States warts and all. I, I agree with that. I think that we should not mythologize ourselves to some, you know, glorious, perfect thing that never was and still isn't. But at the same time, we don't have to adopt this very um, active, useful to activists narrative, this other mythology that paints the picture much more darkly than it is. So in a sense, painting the picture too bright is an error. But painting the picture too dark is also an error. And seeking to do responsible, ethical, historical work, for example, to understand the people who were involved at each stage and to make the best out of what they were saying, I think is a way to, as we say, straighten the record or, or, or correct the record as much as possible. Um, and we should strive, I think, with 
the the fog of history, the epistemic fog of history is real. But we should strive to have the most clear and accurate understanding, and we should try to unearth more documents and more context and understand and accept what's real and what isn't real, rather than trying to force a story onto something and then make that story seem real by contorting the data. And again, I could tell you how Foucault did this with madness and homosexuality. And what what I see in the 1619 Project is a willful attempt to deny progress. It's a story that says this was bad, then this happened and it was still bad, then this happened and it was still bad, then this happened and it was even worse. Whereas that's not really a great way to tell the story. That's not reflective at all of, of, of reality. 